Hi, welcome to Remember This. I'm your host, Denise Boland. I am so excited to talk with my next guest. He's one of the earliest and most iconic child stars. He played Little Ricky on the I Love Lucy show in the 1950s, and he played Johnny Paul Jason on the Andy Griffith show in the 1960s. So without further ado, let's bring him on. Keith Thibodeau. Keith, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Denise. It's, it's oh my gosh, it's it's my honor. Um, I think I saw you on a documentary or in some kind of interview back in the 90s, and, and I said, I would really love to talk to him. I'd love to meet him and talk to him. And I got to do that when you came to New Jersey for the Chiller event. So awesome. awesome. God is good. God is good. Yeah, he is. So you played little Ricky. You were what, four years old? Uh, five years old. You were five years old? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna show I'm gonna show like a few clips and then I'm gonna ask you all about how you got into that. Okay? Okay. And and this is the little boy who plays the Ricardo's son, Richard Keith. You all know him as Ricky Ricardo Jr. <laughs> playing Ricky Ricardo? Well, I don't know. I'm worried. We're not making any more I, have, uh, the, I Love Lucy shows. I Love Lucy. That's a good show, too. I Love Lucy. Uh, so I'll never be more than seven years old. <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, why are you in such a hurry to grow up? I want to get married. But there are a few ladies who want to marry a seven-year-old. <laughs> see yourself as that little boy well it's 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 fun to see pictures of me when i was in in films and i love lucy shows and and things like that where i play the drums it's uh, always always a good memory yeah for me yeah and and you were a natural drummer you started playing drums at what the age of two yes on trash cans in the backyard and we Louisiana, and then uh, went on to um, play with the Horse Height Band in the 1950s, and then ended up auditioning for the Isle of Lucy show. So your father found out about the audition, is that right? Yep. Uh, my dad found out about it and took me to the studio and um, 
played the drums for Lucy on the set and Desi was there and um, he, long story short, he stood up and laughed and said, I think I found little Ricky. I think we found little Ricky. So they, right. they, they signed, um, I signed a seven year contract with Desi Lou and uh, began to start immediately doing the show. I had only background as a musician playing the drums as a little boy, not as an actor. So I had to learn to, to, uh, you know, recite my lines in time and, and all that. And uh, remember some, some of that. Now um, I, I heard that um, Lucy was like, she wanted like professionalism on the set, you know, did that make you feel a little nervous trying to remember your lines? Oh yeah, it was it was totally a, a a pressure cooker, you know, being on that set, and it's more I guess more energy, you know, more more the energy that the show had. Uh, it was a very uh, professional set uh, with professional actors and mm -hmm. professional cameramen and the top the top people in Hollywood, um, you know, and so. Lucy expected everybody to, to know what they were doing and to uh, perform accordingly and uh, to help make the show the success that it was. And you were in front of a live audience also, right? Yeah. So that kind of doubled the, the pressure. Uh, sure. Because you had to, it was like a play, you know, like a New York play um, in front of a live audience. So we didn't we didn't break and, and try it again and take two take three like a movie would or even the andy griffith show which i did later on that mm -hmm. was a one camera shoot as opposed to this was three cameras and everything would be done simultaneously and edited simultaneously for different shots but it 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 was basically presented as a play in front of an audience and did they put up cue cards or anything for you to help you no, a little bit? No, there was no such thing as uh, cue cards for kids back in those days. Okay. Um, the adults, the adults sometimes had it, but uh, mostly it was you either got it or you didn't get it. And I think they had to actually stop and do do it once or twice uh, the whole time I was there. Wow. That's that's pretty good. Who was on set with you? So that was like your mother. My my dad, my dad was actually on set with me, and yeah. he had the he had more of the handle on Hollywood than my mom. She was mom of six kids, and I was the oldest of the six. So she was a home housewife, and my dad took care of the Hollywood stuff. All right. Now. Your siblings, are they all younger than you? Are you the oldest? I'm the oldest and I have I have two two brothers and then three sisters. And then I have two uh, half brothers from my dad's uh, other marriage. Right. And so your siblings, what was their reaction of their big brother being on TV? Do you remember? Well, they, I mean, they didn't, you know, back in those days and, and you don't think much of it, you know, because it's just your brother, you know, but yeah. they knew they knew it was something that was very special. And uh, I was always sort of highlighted in the family as the one, you know, that that was the more famous, the famous one of the family. So that kind of put me in a different category than they in a way yeah but did you feel there was a, like yeah, a they, lot of pressure was there pressure on you to do well yeah there was always that pressure to uh to do yeah. well um my dad was kind of a stage dad um mm -hmm. and he kind of lived his hollywood dream through me in a, in a way and um but you know and and then he succumbed to the hollywood uh, temptations and ended up having an affair um, and then 
subsequently, subsequently got married, had a child, and uh, left our family when I was, we were, I was 15 years old. That must have been devastating for you. It was. For your whole it was family. Very, yeah, it was. It was totally uh, life changing in a in a in a negative way for me. Um, and I blame God for it and uh, was basically totally sad and uh, heartbroken and all the different emotions that, that you, you would have in that kind of situation. Um, my mom said that we would have to move from California uh, back to Louisiana. So I had to leave friends, you know, relations, uh, all these type of things that uh, I had grown up in California. So I had to leave and start a new life of, of the unknown. Didn't know what was to await us. Wow. And you were what, 15 at the time? Yeah. About 15. I was 15. So before we get into that, take us back um, to be, being on set, being around uh, Lucy and Desi and even the children, you got close to the children. Um, what, what was the feeling like? Because well, everybody knows, you know, what was going on with Lucy and Desi in their personal life. Was it uncomfortable on, on set? Did you, did you feel any tension from them? Or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's obviously moments of that, but I mean, most of the time it was, it was totally, totally nice, professional. Nice. Uh, everybody knew what they were going to do. So, you know, you, you basically were well rehearsed and um, everything was fine. I mean, it was, Lucy, Lucy, you know, she loved working and, she loved um, uh, her friendship with Viv and Vivian Vance. And um, of course, William Frawley was great. He was just kind of like, um, you know, an old, vaude old vaudevillian, you know, and um, right. just just uh, kind of a good old guy. And Desi, of course, was very uh, um, exciting guy. He was latin and he he also played the drums played the congas and uh we we got along very well uh on the show yeah so who would you say out of the four of them you were closest to uh, i would say desi uh in that he was you know he was from another country um he um was a percussionist like me and uh, he, um, you know, he actually named my stage name from Keith Thibodeau, renamed me Richard Keith because he thought it would be hard for people to pronounce Thibodeau, my last okay. name, uh, from uh, uh, South Louisiana, which is more of a Cajun heritage where people speak French. So right. it's kind of in that European latin kind of uh culture it's funny because this morning my, my daughters they range from 39 to 17 but all all i love lucy fans oh, wow. and little ricky fans and so they're so excited for this interview so this morning one of my daughters says she goes she goes thibodeau is so much fun to say <laughs> she said the name is so fun <laughs> and it, it does kind it's of roll like off the top it's like uh, tiptoe or, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting name. Yeah. Yeah. I love French. I, I hate, love, like, I, I hated the name when I was, I hated the name when I was growing up in school in California because no one could pronounce it. Right. And uh, I wanted a name like Smith or, you know, something, you know, that would be easy to pronounce. Right. But then as time goes on, people are more uh, globalized. You yes. Know, and internationalized. Yes. It's, it's fun. Yes. Now, one thing I've always wondered, and I don't know if you know why, but um, why didn't they put your name in the credits? Like, why did they just put Little Ricky? Well, I think they wanted people to um, to think that it was their real son. Uh, oh. Little Ricky was born on the same day, or Desi was born on the same day as Little Ricky. 
that was a big story. So they wanted to co connect that and continue to do that in the audience's mind that, that this was their child. And, um, you know, that's what people think and that's what people thought too. Uh, and that was a natural thing for them to think because of the, uh, the proximity of that, all that happening at one time. Yeah. With Desi's birth and little Ricky's birth. Yeah. How about having the baby on the show? You believe they won't let us do it? They said, well, can you hide her, you know, be, be behind high chairs or sitting down on the table? I said, not Lucy. When she gets pregnant, brother, there's no question about it. She, you could even say that we're pregnant in those days. Right. They said, I have to say, expecting. <laughs> It was better for me to use Spectrum anyway. Yeah. You know? yeah. There's a brand new baby at our house. And he knocked um, the inauguration of President Eisenhower off the front pages. Sixteen years later, President Eisenhower was standing outside the Eldorado Country Club, and he said, Is that the young man that knocked me off the front pages? <laughs> Like your little Ricky and I could go no, I'm not. And so so the whole my whole life was about saying to people, no, I'm not who you think I am. They used to say, You're different. I used to go, No, I'm not. We're just kids. Yeah. I think even until this day, Keith, people think little Ricky is Desi Jr. Like they don't put yeah. two and two together. Yeah. Yeah. And they think I'm I'm their real son, uh, of yeah. Desi and Lucy. So it's it's a strange right. kind of role that people think you who you are you know right well they they treated you like their own son right that was like a second family you would go to their house and spend they time did with them. They, they did desi uh, whenever he would give his children um presents gifts he would give me the same thing and took us to uh, la rams games took us to learn how to horseback ride and uh, fish and swim and all these all these different uh, things that, that he was very intentional about that. Bought, bought me a bowling ball that was customized because we, we were into bowling at one point and uh, he got his kids some, so he got me one too, so. Ah, uh, wow. Hello? Oh, hi, Carolyn. Yeah, we got back Friday. Oh, I just loved it. Florida was marvelous. Cuba, well, just bueno, bueno, that's all. Yeah. I met all of Ricky's family, and guess what, Carolyn? I learned how to do the cha-cha-cha. <laughs> Took lessons at the hotel. No, it wasn't too expensive. It came to about $10 a cha. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's sort of like the Roomba, only you uh, you do a lot more of, uh, you know, with them. Uh, and then there are two or three times that you... That you so, so. Mommy, what are you doing? Yeah, well, just a minute. Carolyn, I gotta run now. I I'll call you back later. Okay, dear, bye. Oh, I I'm just dancing, honey. Hi, sweetheart. Well, now, were you a good boy this afternoon? Oh, it was just a doll. He and Uncle Fred have been playing cowboys and Indians. Well, this is the wet this thing unpacked. I'll put it down in the basement. Oh, Fred. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Isn't he cute? That's the way he used to look when he had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Here, cowboy. You better put that back in the wigwam. Go on, honey. You can take that anytime, Fred. I finished unpacking before I went to the PTA meeting. Come on, give me a hand, will you, Ethel? What's the matter? Can't you handle it by yourself? No, I can't handle it by myself. Why not? Because when I lost my hair, I lost my strength. Well, if you expect me to help you, you just lost your mind. Hi. Hi, Frank. Hi, oh, hi, Rick. Hi, honey. Hi, hey, Rick, will you help me put this thing down in the basement? Why, sure, Fred. Come on, grab a hold. Where's little Ricky? Oh, he'll be out in a minute. Honey, here's Daddy. Hi, partner. Hi, Daddy. Hi. Hey, honey, hurry back, will you? Because I want to tell you all about the PTA meeting. We made some wonderful plans. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, absolutely not what? I am not going to cook Spanish food for 800 people at another school bazaar again. <laughs> well, it's not a bazaar. It's a pageant, and it's called the Enchanted Forest. Oh, oh. 
Little Ricky's going to be in it. Oh, is he? Yeah. What's he going to do? I don't know. They haven't assigned the parts yet. Well, if, uh... <laughs> they haven't assigned the parts, how do you know that he's going to be in it? Well, it's being presented by the kindergarten and the first and second grades. He's bound to be in it. Oh, I see. In fact, I assume little Ricky will have the star part. And why do you assume that he's going to have the star part? Well, my goodness, it's perfectly obvious to me that little Ricky has much more talent than any other child in the school. <laughs> it should also be obvious to you that there are a lot of other talented children in school and that their families probably still feel exactly the same way. Well, honey, it's only right that the most talented child get the biggest role. Now, it isn't fair to our son to give him a stale, unimportant little part. Now, Lucy, listen to me. Hey, Ricky, wouldn't you like to go into your room and play with your trains? No, Daddy. I like to stay here. Oh. Well, will you do it as a favor to Daddy? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, partner. Thank you, sweetheart. I'll see you in a minute. Lucy, we know that the child is talented, but that is not the point. It is much more important that he learns how to cooperate and to become a part of a group than it is for him to be the center of attention. Well... No, really, we don't want him to think that, that the world revolves around him. We want him to learn that there are other people that count, too. You know something, honey? You're absolutely right. You know, you're a regular Cuban Dr. Spock. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> then it's all settled, huh? Yeah, it's all settled, baby. Okay. Come on, Fred, let's get this thing downstairs. What, already? <laughs> so I was best friends with Lucy and Desi Jr. And I spent a lot of time at their homes in Beverly Hills, Palm Springs, Corona, Del Mar. Um, a lot of uh, great times, great memories with them. Uh, fishing, horseback riding, hanging out at the beach, uh, doing all those things. and. And, you know, sometimes Lucy would drive us to the beach or drive us to a movie. And uh, it was just special, you know, just, you know, hanging around with them, going to the racetrack at Del Mar, uh, sitting next to Jimmy Durante, uh, who would give us like tips on horses and things like that. So it was just a interesting life uh, at their house. But uh, I, 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 experienced a lot of um, uh, their marital uh, struggles while I was there. And uh, I would occasionally, we occasionally hear them fighting and, um, you know, screaming. It was very scary, you know, for as a kid to, to be able to, um, to, to, to kind of be around that type of environment. And um, I, I just wanted to play, you know, in, in the, with my friends back home where I lived, um, which was a lot easier, you know, just playing baseball, football, playing tag, playing, you know, th then having to uh, deal with, uh, you know, personalities and, and just the struggles that Lucy and Desi had, you know, as being married. So you were so, kind of torn. You were kind of torn between, in, between wanting to spend time with Desi Jr. and Lucy and what was going on there. So, yeah, like, yeah, it was. Did you have a choice little... to go? Like, did you have to go visit, or did you want to go visit? And it's just well, there were there were times I didn't want to go, and my dad would make me because he he worked for the studio, and so his job would have been, you know, on the line if you know he'd be constantly turning things down because people always want favors, they always want you to do things. So if Lucy called and said, "Hey, we want Keith over for the weekend," uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna watch some movies, the first run movies at our home or whatever, you know, I would go, but I was, I, I would always enjoy it. You know, when I went, we would always have a good time. Um, it was definitely a different upbringing, uh, that Lucy and Desi had, uh, and, and myself to a certain extent, but, um, uh, it was sad for them to, to have parents that, that were, throw at each other's throats a lot of times uh, desi senior uh womanizing and alcoholism 
and then Lucy being very jealous and very uh, trying to, you know, make things perfect over there, uh, like on the set, you know, professional. So it just wasn't wasn't working for them at home like it was on the set. And it's kind of amazing. You have to give her credit that she could just put all that out of her mind when she was on set and she was being Lucy Ricardo, you know. Yeah, she was very professional. You know, that's that's what made Lucy Lucy and and uh, made her bigger than life in a lot of you know a lot of ways. And uh, she really uh, was a trooper in that sense. Loved so show business, loved uh, acting, loved um, working. The whole experience of going down to the studio and uh, you know that big studio camaraderie with with all that was involved with those, um, with that industry. And you, you met a lot of celebrities that were on the show. Who was your favorite? Yeah, I think, uh, well, George Reeves, Superman was my, was my kind of like childhood hero. So he came to my birthday on one of the shows. So I really enjoyed being with him. And, uh, uh Maurice Chevalier was a good, um, good guest. I got, a, I got a chance to play drums and sing and dance the, the little, uh, spot you showed um, that episode, Lucy goes to Tijuana, I believe it was. So there was uh, a lot of uh, interesting people that I met. Uh, uh, you know, different guests that would be on the show that that I would, um, you know, see and hang out with and you know, to a certain extent, you know, as a kid, it, it was hard to just kind of be in the grown up, grown up world. But it, all in all, it was um, it was a, a kind of a, a learning experience for me. Do you feel like you missed out on your childhood? Uh, well, I, I definitely made up for it when I was home because I, I was I was really a kid when I was home. But uh, when I was in Hollywood, uh, working, I had to be uh, responsibly uh, an actor, and that was first. You know, I had to, I had to, I had a job to do. So yeah, in a, in a sense, that that was, uh, especially on the Al Lucy show when there wasn't any kids on the show, it was hard for me to um, to to do that because of that fact. All I had was uh, a teacher. Uh, who was uh, tutored me for three hours a day. And then I would do the filming on the side or the, the shots, um, the rehearsals and all that. So it was very um, kind of lonely as a kid uh, going to Hollywood and working. Um, but I've definitely made up for it back home uh, with my friends and you know the, the, the normal life that I lived. I think, I think you spared a lot of uh, what those other child stars have gone through. You know, it's like God had his hands on you, even as a child. Well, do you remember like the last episode? Did you know that this was going to be your last episode? I found out, I think, after the episode was uh, was filmed because uh, they didn't want me to. They thought it might affect my performance. So uh, so I wasn't really told anything until the, the end of it and then it was announced that that was it for the show the show was gonna terminate because of uh lucy and desi's uh impending divorce and uh the fact that they couldn't work they got to the point where they really couldn't work together anymore with each other yeah well i got your book which came out in the yeah. 90s right yes it's, yes it's a great book and yeah, um, thank you. Your life was a roller coaster. <laughs> you, you can say that. Yeah, you can definitely say that. Yeah. It Take was. us to okay. So you you ended up on Andy Griffith. Yeah. Right. Okay. Opie's best friend. Yeah. John Paul Jason. And uh, so, how long were you on there? I think you did like thirteen I on, episodes. I was on about thirteen episodes uh, yep. through yep. several years. Yeah. So uh, I left in nineteen sixty six. California when I was 15 um, and that ended my 
Hollywood time. So I went back to Louisiana and uh, began to uh, play in bands and play in rock bands, garage bands, uh, began to smoke and drink and get into a lot of uh, the drug uh, culture that was so prevalent in the 60s, late 60s, um, did a LSD, you know, cocaine, heroin, all this stuff, and uh, really got down to the end of my rope uh, of my life. And I would have ended up like the child stars that you hear so much about that have such, you know, horrible endings. Uh, I was laying or lying in my, um, my, um, one of those beds that float around those water beds. Oh, water beds. <laughs> yes. Water beds. Yeah. I was, in, I was just remember laying in that bed and I was at that point in my life, I was playing with David and the giants who were a, a very popular rock band in the South. And, um, you know, it was the sex, drugs and rock and roll and all that. But none of that stuff was really making me happy or I was very distressed. I was very uh, suicidal. Um, I was clinically depressed and, you know, I would hear voices uh, telling me to throw myself out of my sports car going 100, you know, 20 miles an hour down the interstate. Oh, no. Um, so it was really a, literally a nightmare that I was in, a swirly nightmare. And uh, it was at that point I was laying in that bed that night. And I remember just at the end of my rope, crying out to God and saying, you know, God, if you're real, I'm sorry for all the terrible things that I've done. Uh, and um, I said, if you'll, you'll save me out of this mess I made in my life, I'll serve you. And um, God heard that prayer. and. I, I, about two weeks later, I, I had uh, was invited to a, a prayer meeting in, in Louisiana. My mother had invited me. And uh, in this meeting, there were people getting healed, people getting delivered, people getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a Catholic charismatic meeting. And uh, I was back uh, on the tail end of the Jesus Revolution, um, 1974. And so... Um, it was such a cool time because it, it, it was, it was, you know, I came from a generation that was searching, you know, for, for, for something, super, something power for supernatural, you know, experiences. And I think we try to do that through drugs. And we try to do that through the enlightenment that those drugs uh, supposedly gave one. But in the end, it was really, uh, a trap of Satan, which would uh, trap you and your life would be totally uh, compromised and invaded by demonic um, entities that would give their instruction to you. And so you would think that it was your own thinking, but it was really a demonic thinking that was really going on. Uh, telling you to to do this or this this terrible thing or or it it was just a very dark time but um as coming out of that into the meeting i was exposed to people who were loving jesus who wanted jesus more than anything else they were priests and nuns who were also in the meeting who were seeking a closer relationship with the Lord and a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I saw that everybody was on the same plane there. And it was such a cool thing to see, um, you know, music being played um, with guitars, you know, and, and just kind of this um, different kind of uh, worship that was spirit led rather than uh, religion led. And I, I didn't want religion. I tried that. I, I went back to Catholic Church and and tried to you know go to mass every morning and go to confession and do all these things that that Catholics are told to do. And um, it it just did, did. I needed a miracle. I didn't need religion. 
And so I, one time I, I was in church and I saw on the, one of the bulletins, I saw where there was a bulletin that said that uh, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside of, of, of the heart. And it was like, that was such a great word for me from the Bible that affected me because I was always concerned what people thought about me. I was always concerned about my outward appearance or my outward behavior. And that I was, you know, nobody liked me. Everybody hated me. I was, you know, a has been in Hollywood. And I was, you know, just kind of a miserable person, moody, depressed. And um, I saw that and it just gave me hope that, you know, hey, there's one that sees me and that's God. Amen. And so I went back after I um, had gone to the meeting in Louisiana and saw where um, the Lord touched my life and, and gave me a vision of Jesus, revelation of Jesus that I had. I talk about in my book, Life After Lucy. Um, and uh, my brother, 12 year old brother was beside me and he felt a, a power holding him down on the ground and he didn't know what it was, but he couldn't get up from that. It's like a big hand was holding him down. But I, I had a vision of Jesus, and he revealed himself as uh, the light of the world, uh, more love than the whole universe could contain, more power than the whole universe could contain, and that he had died for me, this Jesus of Nazareth that died 2,000 years ago on the cross, and he rose again from the dead, and he's alive. And so he was showing himself alive. And I said, Lord, are you really like this, this amazing? And he said, Three words, he said, yes, I am. And when he said that, I came up out of the vision. And later on, I would see in the Bible where he's called the great I am. Yes. He, I am who I say I am. I am, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, so he, he, he kind of left his calling card there. And uh, it was so cool that I went back to the guys and said, Guys, we can be forgiven our sins. We can be delivered. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can understand the Bible. God is greater than, than all our problems, and, and we need to change the music. We need to be playing more godly music than secular music as far as the, the words go. We can still play the same um, music, just change the lyrics. So they, they thought I flipped out on another drug and and they said, you'll be all right in a couple of weeks. But uh, I just kept talking about Jesus and saying there's more to the Bible than what men have led us to believe. And uh, amazingly, miracul miraculously, all the, the three guys in the band came to the Lord and became Christians. Praise and then, in, yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, it's yes. just totally amazing. So we, then you we and, go ahead. Yeah, you became like a Christian rock band then. Then we began to play Christian rock. And uh, I started to play with them in 1979. They actually started in 77 playing uh, well, without a drummer. And so we played the decade of the 80s. And the first place we went overseas was England. And we played for punk rockers in England and baptized them in the River Thames. That's and awesome. You know, it was just totally amazing time. And and we, then we ended up touring all over the U.S. and ministering to different churches and different colleges and schools and festivals and saw God do amazing things during that time.
get on the right road. Get on the road. People's lives changed. People who came to our concert later became pastors. So we saw a lot of fruit. We saw a lot of uh, drug people that came to the Lord and through uh, the ministry of David and the Giants, which is the name of the band. How ironic. <laughs> How ironic we would have that name, huh? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. David slew, he slew the giant. That's right. Uh, That's so right. I... I, I read when you met your future wife, your now wife, when I met, um, when you first met her, you knew, the both of you knew that you were to be married because of a scripture in the Bible. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, we were. We both came from broken homes. I met Kathy. She's a ballet dancer in Jackson out of David and the Giants uh, rock band, uh, secular rock band concert that we had or a gig. And um, that I met her there and instantly fell in love and wanted to, you know, knew that God had something special. And but I wanted to make sure and we wanted to make sure. And so um, uh, we. We pr- I told Kathy, I said, let's pray about it if we were to get married or not, because I wanted to marry her. And she said yes. And so we prayed about it. And I said, OK, I want you to open up the Bible on the other side of the room. Close your eyes and point to a scripture and whatever it says, we'll we'll take that as God's answer to whether we should get married or not. So she went to the other side of the room. We prayed and opened up the book, and it was a living Bible, one of those green living Bibles that we had back in the day. And uh, it said it was from the book of Ruth, and it was the scripture that that she, her hand fell on. It is I, Ruth, make me your wife according to God's holy ordinance or law. And we got married that night. We eloped. We went to the justice of the peace, and then we got married in front of our family. A couple of weeks later with uh, Kathy's uh, uncle or cousin who was a who was a Methodist preacher. So we've been married almost 47 years now. So That's wonderful. praise God. Praise, praise God. God is right. Praise God. And uh, she's a ballet dancer. And can you tell us about uh, your company? Yeah, the company is Ballet Magnificat. And uh, actually, our daughter We have one daughter, Tara, who's here right now choreographing um, uh, and rehearsing a a ballet called Stratagem, which is from C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters, which is about the whole demonic um, strategy against Christians and non-Christians in the world. It's very uh, unveiling of sort of like their their strategy and stratagem. Cool ballet. But... uh, so she's here and we've got one grandson who's nine years old, just turned nine recently. And um, they're precious and uh, they're awesome. And God is good uh, for us to, to, to uh, have a ministry that is, is um, magnifies him through the, da- the, through the dance. So it's, that's the name of the ba- uh, of the, of the, the ballet is Ballet Magnificat the ballet that magnifies the Lord. And uh, we, we, we started in 1986. We have a company, we have a training program. We have a, a workshop that's getting ready to begin in a couple, couple days. And um, which attracts about 300, 400 kids training from all over the world and the U S we also started a company in Brazil called ballet Magnificat Brazil in Curitiba. And uh, we have a company and a training program and a school there. And um, company just got back from Israel and Europe uh, about a month ago. We went on tour there. We've been to over 40, probably about 50 uh, countries now around the world that the company has performed. And uh, and and the, the purpose of Ballet Magnificat is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to the widest possible audience through dance and uh, and through dance stories that we do, bi- biblical stories uh, set to dance and choreography. And uh, it's, it's really so unique, you know, uh, the fact that we are like America's premier Christian ballet company. There's no ballet company that's Christian, which they have some now, but that does it on the scale that Ballet Magnificat does and is doing right now. It, it's it's amazing. I'm going to go back to David, Second Samuel six fourteen to twenty three. He danced. He leaped before the Lord with all his might. And so, what you guys are doing, you're sharing the love of God through the dance. And I saw a little clip on YouTube when you were in Israel. You did the hiding place, the story of Corey yeah. Temple and her sister Betsy. Yeah, love, Cor- love Corey Temple. I, I love. Yeah, that. yeah, it was awesome. We we were we performed in about five different theaters in Israel in different cities to uh, the Russian Holocaust survivors. And we were there for uh, the Holocaust Remembrance Day and week. So um, it was so good because we got a chance to hand out 
uh, copies of uh, Corey Tim Boom's book, The Hiding Place, to the Russian Holocaust survivors who are who are Jewish. They're not Christian, but they wanted to read the story of this Corey Tim Boom. And in that book, it has her testimony, of course, and her Christian witness in there. So what a what an opportunity that we had to hand out over a thousand uh, of those books and sign them for them. That is so wonderful. This play is an amazing story of two uh, young Dutch girls. They were dedicated Christians, and uh, in the time of horror, when it, it was forbidden just to help Jewish people, they took a risk and they tried to save them. So when you see the story of the hiding place and you see how the Ten Boom family looked to God for guidance on how to help and support Jewish people, it's very encouraging. And today, Christian Americans, they came to Israel to perform this story. It is an actual realization of that support. We come to Israel because it's the most important place for us to come. Uh, as believers, we believe that Israel is the chosen nation. And we're very thankful to be here in one of our favorite places with the purpose of um, sharing the love of God through the gift of dance. It was absolutely amazing, both music performance and how the dancers portrayed all the emotions, and also how accurately they depicted what happened to our people. It was absolutely stunning. I was happy that from time to time they brought some happy moments uh, just to show that life was not all the time sad. No, we found ways how to make ourselves happy, how to forget. And you should look after the light, never give up. I think it is very important to tell this story so that one, we do not repeat it, but two, to grow from our what was and to become better. What your organization Helping Hand Global Forum doing. It's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, we'll see more and more that the survivor is uh, going from us, and it's why we need to remember everything what happened. It's so important because if we know the history, it will never happen. And if we forget the history, it can be happened again. This play and this performance very much impacted the lives of the Holocaust survivors whom I spoke to uh, just right now. So we want to say thank you to Ballet Magnificat for coming and uh, just giving such a wonderful gift for the Holocaust survivors. Uh, such a powerful play, such a powerful message. This is very important for the next generation to remember and to keep these stories alive and because once again so many people are forgetting that this took place. We love the Jewish people. We love Israel. And uh, we'll prob probably be going again um, in the spring. We've got our company, Brazil company, probably going in December to do a, 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 a musical play that's set with dance and uh, singers and orchestra called uh, uh, Mendel's Messiah. The musical. Oh, wow.
And um, so we hopefully that'll be all there. And then we'll go back in the spring, Lord willing, and do either hiding place or um, be there for the Passover. So do you think you would ever come to New York? We have a beautiful theater here on Staten Island. St. Well, George you need, Theater. You need to bring us there. <laughs> I, I will definitely I have friends with the owners and I will definitely speak to them about awesome. having you. We need yeah, that here, man. Keith. Keith, I'm in a blue state. <laughs> we need that here. Uh, Actually, I think we're red. <laughs> Just oh really? People are more awake, even though, yeah. People are waking up today. So uh, but but we Hopefully. do we do need that. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for give, you know, for all you've done, giving yourself to the art. I mean, you, you're a staple in America. My granddaughter, she'll only watch the I Love Lucy episodes that you're in. <laughs> ah, it's funny. It looks a little Ricky. Uh, you know, you've brought so much joy and happiness to millions of people, you know, so I thank just you. want to thank you for that. And uh, thank, thank you. you for sharing your heart. Thank you for sharing, yeah. you know, your testimony. And it's an encouragement. It's definitely encouragement to, to so many people that are going through struggles. And, you know, there is hope in the yeah. Lord. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, do you think you can close this out in prayer? Yeah, I will. I will definitely oh, do that. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for uh, bringing your salvation to us in such a great way. And um, just thank you for laying down your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, a, a horrible death. And thank you for rising from the dead, raising from the dead. And um, thank you, Lord, that you're uh, at the right hand of God now, alive, uh, interceding for us right now. And I pray for each and every one listening to this broadcast, if anyone is going through any struggles or, or sorrows or, or uh, they need encouragement today, I pray that you would do and meet all their needs uh, according to your riches and glory, God. You are Jesus. You are Lord. You're Lord over our life. You're Lord over our bodies. You're Lord over our, our future. You're Lord over this nation. And we pray, God, that you would have mercy on this nation, that you would have mercy on America and that it would come back to you and that it would be uh, that, that, that things would be released to, um, to, to, to bring uh, freedom and doors open uh, for your, for your good news to go forth. And I pray that each one of us that are Christians would be stronger Christians. And I pray those who are not, in faith right now that they would have faith in you lord and that they would trust in you and they would trust in your works your righteousness your salvation your truth your peace that you give with god through jesus through the faith of jesus and through uh, the blessed word uh that is a lamp into our feet a light into our path thank you lord for saving me delivering me rescuing me from all the things that i was in and um we just we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the joy that's set before us uh, and our inheritance in you. We thank you, Father, and all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Keith, thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless you. Appreciate I feel it. like I, I made a new friend, brother, brother in the Lord, and maybe sometime in the future I could have uh, you and Kathy come on. And that'd be uh, awesome. Hear more of your story. Okay. Thank that'd you so awesome. much. God bless you and your family. I appreciate it.